Good evening, viewers. Welcome to the episode of RC Expert, initiated by Newman Health. With me on call today is Dr. Iyengar. Sir is an alumni of FMC. He was professor at St. John's Medical College and now at Manipal Hospital. And you'll be surprised there will be many doctors in today's world who will be trained under Dr. Iyengar. And he's been looked upon and sir has a vast knowledge about dyslipidemia. So we thought, why not have him on this topic? You all must be aware about cholesterol. Cholesterol, a waxy substance, which is always in news. We all are worried about it, like our blood pressure. The other thing which people worry about is their cholesterol. We keep thinking that if we have it, what will go wrong, whether we'll have stroke, whether it's going to give us heart attack. And most of us think of it as just clogging our arteries. But you'll be surprised. Our body also produces cholesterol. And it is actually required for all our hormones and cells to function properly. It is essential for life. It is a building block. And it also helps in rejuvenating of our liver. So we should not make it as a culprit, but anything in excess is always bad. So sir is going to talk to us what is dyslipidemia and how it can affect us and what are the cures for it. Thank you, sir, for joining us on Ask the Expert today. Thank you, Puneet, for your kind words of introduction. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to uh, share with you some facts about uh, dyslipidemia and its management. Now, we know that atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease means that includes uh, coronary artery disease like heart attacks, includes cerebrovascular disease like strokes, it also includes peripheral artery disease like, you know, which causes gangrene of the limbs sometimes. Now, coronary artery disease, the heart attacks and uh, uh, are a uh, little different in our country as compared to the Western countries. In our country, this disease, that is heart attacks, manifests about a decade earlier as compared to the Western population. And it is more severe in its form and it carries higher mortality. Now, there are a number of risk factors that have been identified all across the world, and it applies to all populations in the world. It's not different in India, as shown by different studies which have included our country, like inter-heart study and pure study. They've all shown that there are some risk factors which will increase the risk of heart attacks in our population. Now, one of the major modifiable or correctable risk factor is dyslipidemia. There is abnormal lipid pattern. Now, amongst the lipid uh, metrics, the LDL cholesterol is the target for our treatment. Now, whenever you're going to manage dyslipidemia, first we assess the risk of the patient or the subject, be it primary prevention or secondary prevention. This risk assessment includes not only cholesterol, it includes is a holistic approach. It includes other factors like his weight, family history, smoking, diabetes, hypertension, and uh, family history. All these will be included. Then we put him into a different risk categories. Whether is at low risk or whether it's very high risk. Because the treatment depends, the intensity of treatment depends on the risk the patient or the subject has for heart attacks or any other cardiovascular disease. Now for this risk assessment, you know, we can't follow the Western uh, guidelines to assess risk in our population because that will underestimate the risk. So if at all someone has to follow the risk assessment, either you follow the Lipid Association of uh, India recommendations, which has appeared in our Indian journals, which will is a simple one. There is no calculation involved, and there is uh, no uh, class of recommendation or level of evidence. The simple algorithm based on the major risk factors and other non-conventional risk factors you put in a, in a particular category. And otherwise, if you are you're fond of for doing the scorecard medicine, then you can go into the cure risk, which is uh, recommended by the UK health authorities because those uh, guidelines included the studies where a lot of Asians were included in that particular study. So it applies very closely to our population. So once you assess the risk, then you start the treatment. The first line of treatment is always a therapeutic lifestyle changes. You have to change the, your therapeutic I mean, lifestyle. 
like your eating habits, for your exercise, stopping smoking, reducing weight, and reducing the stress in life. All these have to be the first line. They are an integral part of any management of dyslipidemia. And the next one is, as I mentioned, earlier cholesterol is the target that has been established and accepted by universally by all the uh, countries in the world that LDL should be our target. It has been shown to be the culprit of uh, this all heart attacks and strokes by genetic studies, by randomized controlled trials, by epidemiological studies, observation studies, meta-analysis. So that is the target for our treatment. And the first line of treatment after the therapeutic lifestyle changes is statin. Statin is a drug which is uh, quite uh, easily accessible, cheap nowadays, and very effective and very safe. It has established beyond doubt its efficacy and safety in managing dyslipidemia and reducing the risk of uh, cardiovascular disease. Okay. Uh, so, Doctor, uh, we would want to understand if somebody starts his drug, a statin, and uh, is there any chances that he or she might have to come continue with it for a lifetime or maybe they can stop the drug after taking it for some time? No, we have to continue it for lifelong. Statins, once started, has to be continued for lifelong. Usually we don't start in all patients. As I mentioned, we assess the risk. If it's an indication, we start the treatment and he has to continue it throughout his life. It could be possible to reduce the dose or increase the dose depending on his periodic assessment because studies have shown that if you stop statin, again, the cholesterol will go up and you're likely to have the events, cardiac events. So one should not stop statin unless uh, advised by a qualified physician or cardiologist, depending on the level of LDL cholesterol reached and depending on any side effects you have had, Yes, it could be modified, it could be reduced, titrated, but not stopped on your own. Don't stop statins on your own. Uh, so usually, it's um, when you read the Western guidelines, usually the Americans and others are started at either 40 or 80 milligram. But surprisingly, Indians respond very well to 20 or a 10 milligram dose. It's only people with uh, cardiovascular events are started on 40 or 20. But many of these patients also then tend to titrate back to 10 milligrams. Why so? Any reason for that? Uh, yeah, the response to statin is variable. Now, for example, uh, uh, it probably uh, depends to some extent on the uh, genetics and as well as the body weight probably. But the dose of statin is decided by the risk the patient has and the level of LDL cholesterol he has. And we have an LDL cholesterol target. So we want to bring it down by say 60%. So you have to give high intensity statin. And if patient is at low risk, probably you could start him on a, a moderate intensity statin and uh, probably continue that. So the statin dose depends on the risk the patient has and the LDL goal you want to achieve. Uh, doctor, earlier people were actually given phenofibrates and all it, isolated triglycerides were on the higher side, but now it's a fixed dose combination or you would give a double dosing, both the statin as well as phenofibrates. Uh, yes, fibrates came actually much before the statin era and uh, they uh, unfortunately statin, fibrate studies did not show any benefit in the cardiovascular outcome. Now, nowadays, we don't use fibrates to bring down LDL cholesterol. Fibrates are reserved for treating high triglycerides. Mm -hmm. And particularly if it is definitely more than 800 milligram per deciliter triglycerides, then you try to use fibrates. There, the idea is to reduce the uh, complication like pancreatitis. Whereas, as for the cardiovascular risk is concerned, the drug of choice is statin. And if patient is on statin, they have reached the LDL goal. If his triglyceride continues to be high beyond 400 milligram, then probably you can add fibrates. Though the most of the Western guidelines uh, don't describe, uh, don't recommend the fibrates for bringing out LDL cholesterol or even triglycerides. 
but very high triglyceride. Isolated treatment for high triglyceride is fibrates to reduce the risk of pancreatitis. So if isolated only the triglyceride, if your total cholesterol is under the range, LDL, HDL are under the range, uh, then you can just give them and a phenofibrate. Then you can use fibrates because there are studies which have shown the, not the main studies, but the uh, post hoc analysis studies have shown that it does give some benefit uh, in reducing the cardiovascular events, but over and above use of stat with statins. Uh, so I just wanted to understand why Indians have a lower HDL. Comparatively, whenever you see in most of the picture, people tend to have, whether it's male or a female, we tend to have a lower HDL compared to others. Yes. Now, HDL has always been a, a problematic. You know, it started saying that the one thing is your low HDL is considered as a risk factor. High HDL, people thought it will give protection. So people found out many drugs which include the HDL cholesterol, but that didn't translate to any benefits at all. So nowadays, nobody is trying to increase the HDL cholesterol with drugs. Of course, you can continue to try to increase it with your exercise, but not with drugs. No drugs have shown which increase HDL cholesterol to confer any benefits. Now, in Indians have a unique sort of lipid profile. They usually have low HDL, high triglycerides, and normal to high LDL cholesterol. But if you, in the same population, if you look at what is called another non-HDL cholesterol, means total cholesterol minus the HDL cholesterol, means all bad cholesterol will come under non-HDL cholesterol. That is still high amongst the Indians because the uh, SDL is low. Now, this has probably something to do that one is the genetics, ethnicity, and secondly, the metabolic syndrome. People who have central obesity and who have, you know, there are a lot of definitions for metabolic syndrome that is quite common amongst Indians. So, they are the reasons for low SDL cholesterol. But the research has shown that the high SDL cholesterol doesn't give protection in any community, whether it is South Asian or the non-South Asian community. Whereas the low SDL cholesterol is harmful in particularly the Western population, but it doesn't cause any harm in the Asian population. That is the latest study that is available. Okay. So that's a great news because most of our viewers, when they get their are customers when they get their blood test done we are always worried about their low hdl okay. yeah so they, uh, i have a question but before that dharmendra agrawal has asked how to solve high bp problem high bp problem yeah uh, high bp problem you have to get it checked properly and don't look only at blood pressure look at all other risk factors because blood pressure is again hypertension is again a major modifiable risk factor for atherosclerotic uh, cardiovascular disease. So it should be uh, checked properly. And if it's persistently high, it should be treated with, apart from lifestyle interventions and with the drugs. Nowadays, again, the, the drugs are very safe and very effective with very few side effects. And you need to have the complete assessment because hypertension, as I mentioned, is a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Apart from looking at the other risk factors, you should all look at the target organ damage which has caused, like has it caused any problem in the eye or in the heart or in the kidneys by doing all the tests like fundoscopy, assessment of the cardiovascular system like your ECG, echocardiogram, excise tests, and assessment of your blood sugar, assessment of your peripheral arteries, all these must be done. So, Dharminder, you can, if you're taking any drugs or if you can just mention how much is your BP, uh, we'll be able to answer it now. So, he's written, my BP increases with every food and drink. Please suggest some good treatment. Neurokine gold, if capsule and syrup, can, can it make the BP high? So, he's talking about some multivitamin which can make the BP uh, No, your BP increase very, uh, every food and drink. So first thing is drink me, you mean you have many alcoholic drinks, I, I hope, I think you are referring to alcoholic drinks, that you should stop or reduce it to in a very moderate 
quantities. And uh, you have to have, as I mentioned, you should have all the checks done. Don't look only at the blood pressure figures. Have a holistic risk assessment of yourself, including, of course, cholesterol, sugars, your body weight, your exercise habits, your eating habits, like you must reduce salt in your diet, you must reduce the carbohydrate intake and saturated fat intake, increase the intake of uh, leafy vegetables, fruits, nuts would increase, do regular exercise, and then no, the, the hormones, I mean, these uh, vitamins will not decrease your blood pressure. You have to have proper checkup, get your complete assessment done, as I mentioned, and, uh, and the treatment nowadays is very effective, very safe for hypertension. So you must, and hypertension, you know, you know it's fortunate that you know that your blood pressure is high. This is also being referred to as a silent killer. We, we come across many patients who come to the hospital for the first time with stroke, with heart attacks, and you detect that they have very high blood pressure. So this is a very silent killer. So, but you are fortunate that you have you know that your blood pressure is high, so you can control it. Go to your physician, get it controlled. Okay. Uh, so, sir, uh, before we wait for the audience, I already had a few questions with me before I came on the call. So, there's been a person who's been a diabetic for the last 10 years, hypertensive, on treatment. Uh, his HbA1c is always in the range of 6 and above. It's usually actually 6 and point, 6.5 and above, despite taking free medicines to control oral hypoglycemic CCP. Recently, his cholesterol has, total cholesterol is 321. Uh, triglycerides are not that very high, but uh, his, uh, so he's quite worried. Do I take statin or do I start with lifestyle modification? No, once you have been diagnosed as diabetes and hypertension, I mean, your risk is high for those cardiovascular disease. You should be on statin, irrespective of your cholesterol levels. But your cholesterol has already gone up. So you should have been on statin right from the day you have been diagnosed as diabetes. Now, diabetes, as you know, that it is preceded by what is called the pre-diabetic stage. The pre-diabetic stage is always for a few years. And during these few years only, there are a lot of metabolic abnormalities like insulin resistance, endothelial dysfunction, metabolic abnormalities, and cholesterol being high is already some damage to your vessels. So you should, the, what the, our recommendation, the Lipid Association of India recommendation is, the day you diagnose diabetes, you should be on statin along with other treatment like diet and anti-diabetic drugs. So your cholesterol, your cholesterol, cholesterol is high, so you should be on uh, statin. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we assess the risk you got diabetes, you got hypertension, so you will probably fall into high risk. So you need a high intensity statin. Your uh, what again I mentioned was LDL cholesterol is the target now. That is the first target which everybody accepts because easily done and it has been intentioned into a practice that LDL cholesterol is the target. Now, though the non-STL and FOB are coming, but first target is LDL cholesterol. So you must bring it down. Your case probably should be less than. 70 milligram per deciliter. So diet, exercise, proper diabetic control, and statin. If it is not controlled, if it is not coming down, you can add azetimide, an additional drug to bring down the cholesterol. And your diabetic treatment, I hope they have included the SGLT2 inhibitors in your uh, treatment because uh, uh, you are at uh, high risk and uh, is a good treatment for diabetes, which gives you protection apart from bringing down your sugars. Not it doesn't cause hypoglycemia, but it gives protection against heart problems and kidney problems. So we keep saying that it protects your pump, uh, pipes, and filter. Pump, pipes, and the pump is the heart, filter is your vessels, filter is the kidney. Thank you. So I think if he's watching the episode, he should take the cue. Otherwise, we'll ask him to watch the episode and take the answer for his question. So this one question which we had is not actually related to cholesterol, but uh, he's written that my Ajmal Jamal has written, my wife is suffering from aortic wall stenosis. Her age is 48. 
but these days her problem has increased she's facing a lot of abnormal pulse palpitation and not feeling well so when they visited the doctor the doctor gave him siplar 10 three times a day uh, then ecosprin 75 mg rosuvastatin he's mentioned 50 mg must be 20 it might be a type error and cytocard capsules so just yeah. wanted to know is this the right treatment what more does he want yeah that doesn't give me complete picture of what i mean she has basically aortic stenosis now the aortic stenosis causes are you know that one is congenital other one is uh, rheumatic which doesn't cause usually isolated aortic stenosis which is again rare but we should exclude uh, we should have a detailed echocardiographic study done find out what is the severity of aortic stenosis does she have a bicuspid aortic valve and any aortic involvement that should be seen and she has having palpitations see the aortic stenosis patients can develop what is called atrial fibrillation and that could be uh, quite uh, risky in these patients so you should have a detailed investigation done for a cardiovascular system that includes uh, ecg if required so called 24 hours ecg monitoring holter to find out what is the cause of palpitation and uh, echocardiograph to assess the severity of aortic stenosis and try to find out what is the cause for aortic stenosis with another rare cause which probably is seen much earlier in the of course she is about She's forty years. She's forty-eight. Yeah. yeah, we see, of course, in children, not uh, people who are born with familial hypercholesterolemia, they can have severe uh, valvular uh, calcium throat stenosis. So, but you have to get assessed fully. What is the cause of your aortic stenosis? What is the cause? What is the severity of aortic stenosis? And what is the cause of palpitation? Now, what you have been given is. Uh, a beta blocker that is cipla 40 uh, that just reduces the heart rate uh, and cytogard is probably trimetazepine is a metabolic uh, drug and statin you have to look at uh, your uh, uh, cholesterol levels because uh, earlier there was a concept that statins will reduce the calcific uh, aortic stenosis but it doesn't have any Protective action against the calcific aortic valve stenosis, unless the patient has high cholesterol. So you have to get fully assessed. Don't stop at this. Please get uh, complete ECG, alter monitoring, uh, lipid levels, and full echocardiographic uh, study to assess the severity. And then, because if the aortic stenosis is very severe, then there are a number of options available to treat that. Okay, so I think uh, if Jamil is on the call, he could have taken that, or he can watch it later. So th there's another question, which uh, 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 not the age and anything. Muhammad Salim has written, my triglycerides are 238, total cholesterol is 201. What can I do? Yeah, uh, now your of course uh, triglycerides are high. Your uh, total cholesterol is 230. That is also high. So you have about. 201, 201. Also on the higher side. As I mentioned, our target is really we look at the LDL cholesterol also. But you have got probably mixed uh, dyslipidemia. LDL is also high and cholesterol is high and triglycerides are high. Now, if you're looking at only triglyceride, now the most important treatment for high triglyceride is lifestyle modification. Now you have to reduce your weight. If you're obese, you reduce your weight, triglycerides will come down. If you're not exercising enough, you exercise regularly, your triglycerides will come down. Dietary modification, you must reduce your carbohydrate intake and increase the intake of uh, uh, leafy vegetables and uh, pulses, etc. So your triglycerides will come down. And we also try to exclude two other important secondary causes like thyroid, uh, hypothyroidism, and kidney problem. So you have to get your urine checked up, any proteinuria to see any kidney problem. Get your thyroid checked up by TSH with a hypothyroidism. So there are a lot of secondary causes for elevated triglycerides. And in 50% of the patients, we are able to bring it down with lifestyle modification alone. As I mentioned, you have to in, uh, start all these measures and measure your 
uh, try to start again at an interval of eight to twelve weeks, and I'm sure it will come down. And if it hasn't come down, but if LDL cholesterol is so high, your treatment is statin. Start with statin. Bring your LDL cholesterol down to the target which you assess by deciding your risk. And once that is reached, then if the triglyceride is more than 400 still, then you could use fibrates. So I think first foremost, he needs to take care of his diet, bring down his triglyceride. Yeah. So, so there's a question from Malar Anand. So please confirm whether regular medication is good for cholesterol. If not, what is the precaution to keep in mind? So I think she's asking about statin, okay, whether regular medicines like statin are good for cholesterol. Yes. As I mentioned earlier also, we don't recommend statin in everybody. As I mentioned, we put them into low risk rather than high risk on the other end. If somebody is in low risk, we don't start statin. We say that you follow lifestyle measures and reassess after three months. And nowadays, there are a number of other uh, non-conventional risk factors or additional tests we can do to find out if we are at high risk. So, but once you start statin, it is a lifelong companion for you. You can't give it up. You can only reduce it or increase it. Or if you're intolerant or reduce any, develop any serious problem, probably you could change over to some other drugs. But once you're on statin, you're tolerating it well, you must continue throughout your life. Yeah. So Meetu Gupta is asking, so first Malar Anand, hope you're satisfied with the answer. If you have any pertaining more question, you can ask. Meetu Gupta is asking, how does beta blocker cause side effects like high triglycerides and high cholesterol? So she wants to know, the, does beta blocker cause all this? Those are good drugs when you use where it is indicated. And the side effects are minimal. It might increase uh, uh, triglycerides and reduce HDL cholesterol. And otherwise, but it is not, I mean, we don't stop beta blocker just because somebody's uh, uh, tight size has gone up slightly or HDL cholesterol has come down slightly. It doesn't cause serious lipid abnormalities of clinical relevance. But the other side effects, of course, uh, precipitation of bronchial asthma, or worsening of peripheral artery disease, or causing bradycardia. These are some other problems. We never have any serious side effects with beta blocker associated with lipid abnormalities. Okay. So I hope, Meetu, you're satisfied with the answer. If you have any other question, you can post it for us. Uh, so again, there's one question which had come to me before the call. Uh, how long should one take Rosewa statin? Does one need to continue? So it's the same that you've been answering. Once you have started... Once you have started, is a lifelong, as I mentioned, companion. Better get used to that companion. And as I mentioned, there could be modulation of your dose. Otherwise, you don't stop it. Because there are studies which have shown people, particularly those who have given, been given statin for second prevention, they stop it. They have rebound effect. They have increased incidence of cardiovascular events. So don't stop statins unless you have developed some serious problem with statins or you have achieved a target, very really low target, and you want to reduce the dose, it is fine. Not otherwise. You don't stop statin. Because some of the studies have shown the, the cholesterol levels as low as 10 milligram in 10% of the studies patients, and they don't have any side effects. And there are uh, children born with children when the newborn has got an LDL cholesterol of 30 to 40. And there is a period when the growth is rapid, so it doesn't cause any problem. There are families with uh, genetic abnormalities where uh, uh, the LDL cholesterol is very low, in the range of 12 to 15 milligram per, uh, milligram per deciliter. And they have grown up well. One of them is a physical instructor, lady physical instructor. One of them is a housewife with two children. So none of them have had any side effects with low LDL cholesterol. Uh, so, so commonly seen with uh, statin is muscle pain or muscle weakness. So in that case, what is the alternative given if somebody has high cholesterol or it is used for secondary prevention? Yes. Now, statins do cause uh, some sort of muscular problems. 
And if you take, uh, it is about anywhere between 5% to 7% of the population for a statin can develop. And this is more common in with high intensity statin therapy. Now, this uh, muscular pain can happen. <coughs> it may be what we call sometimes it is a real problem. Sometimes it could be what is called the nocebo effect because the person has read that if you take statin, you get muscular pain. So they are the patients who develop muscular pain. And uh, study has shown that if they have studied the large number of population who complained of muscular pain and they stopped and restarted. So 70% of them could tolerate statin. So what we do is patients who develop pain in the muscles, we again try to exclude two things. One is hypothyroidism because they are very prone to develop muscular pain with statins. And the second one is vitamin D deficiency. If those who have vitamin D, they are also likely to develop muscular pain with statins. So we try to correct these two. Otherwise, if they are not have this, then we do their uh, CK, that is the muscle enzymes we do, if it is very high, then we need to stop statins and then reintroduce the statin after a gap of two weeks with a small dose of statin or a different statin or statin given at reduced frequency that you can give it alternate day or twice a week. So if we may be able to tolerate that, if he doesn't tolerate that also gets pain with that, then we have other drugs, non-statin therapies like azetimibe, and now we have a new drug called bempedoic acid. And uh, if this also doesn't help, we can use the PCSK9 inhibitors. If you don't achieve the LD target, you want to get these drugs. So statin uh, induced uh, adverse muscular events are not very common, but should not for, should take a note of when the patient complains, he has what muscular pain, try to assess his vitamin D levels and thyroid levels and try to reduce the dose or switch over to another, uh, say you're giving the rosovastatin, you could change your rosovastatin, it doesn't tolerate, you reduce the dose to an alternate day or twice a week and try it. If you still doesn't respond, then you go to estimate and other non-statin drugs. Okay, so I think uh, people should take the cue that they should not read too much about the side effects. They should let the drug act. And if somebody actually gets, we can give a, break and then restart the drug to see if they uh, so sir i'll just have a last question it's not related to cholesterol so it was given by pk malo Mopatra. he said i'm suffering from high blood pressure since last two years i regularly take telma 40 is there any other solution to the problem no as i mentioned again uh, high blood pressure we don't look only at blood pressure you must uh, look holistically and assess all other risk factors like uh, you know your sugar your cholesterol your uh, target organs like look at your eyes kidneys and heart everything is fine your blood pressure is well controlled with telma that is tell me start on 40 milligram you continue that if it is well controlled there is no need to take any other drug if it is not well controlled you can always add the good combination is tell me start on with a, a small dose of diuretic or tell me start on with a calcium channel block. So these are with good good combinations with the tell me start on. But if it is not well controlled, you should do it. But don't stop only looking at only at the blood pressure readings. Please look at other aspects of your, of your body, uh, like other target organs and other risk factors you should look at. So thank you, sir. It was a very valuable session. And I think people should not worry or look at numbers. If they have dyslipidemia, first they should try doing some lifestyle modification. If not, then they should start taking a drug which will actually help them save developing secondary complication or primary complication of uh, dyslipidemia. Thank you, sir. It was a very thank valuable you. session. Thank you. For thank you for your Yeah. And Thanks, uh, thank, thank you, viewers, who have joined the live show. But those who could not watch it live can watch it later. And if they have a question, they can post it. We'll get the answer from the expert. Do like, share, and subscribe. And keep watching Ask the Expert to get questions to all your health-related queries.
good day and good evening everybody thank you